turning to today's topic, it's about joints, about uh, the places where two bones come together so that movement is possible. And uh, the movement not only is possible, it is by and large smooth, friction-free, and painless. And we take it for granted till we are afflicted with pain in one of the joints. Uh, before I turn to the PowerPoint, let's uh, talk a little bit about the types of movements that are possible. And uh, we'll talk just about a few major ones because uh, you're not going to, you're not taking an exam in anatomy. And therefore, uh, there's no point uh, sort of going into all the variations in movements that are possible. But some of the major ones, yes. Uh, flexion, we have all heard of. Flexion is sort of bending. From that comes, you know, the expression flexing your muscles. So this is flexion. Huh? And uh, the opposite of this is extension. Extension is expanding. So sort of expanding. This is uh, uh, extension and this is flexion coming back. Something, you know, like uh, in yoga, we say that every time you hold yourself up, you exhale. And when you expand yourself, inhale. By and large, it would correspond to that. So flexion and extension. Huh? It's possible at a uh, very large variety, of large number of joints, flexion and extension. But along with that, we have other types of movement possible, moving away from the midline or moving towards it, like the shoulder. Moving away, coming closer. Huh? Or like this. Several movements combined. So moving away, is abduction, moving towards is abduction. You know? uh, if you remember what abduction is, then uh, one would uh, easily understand the opposite will be adduction. And what is abduction? To abduct is to kidnap, to take away somebody. Yeah? So that's the way one can remember. So moving away is abduction and the opposite is adduction, coming closer. And uh, then we have all types of rotation. And again, the shoulder joint is the one where all this is possible. So, rotation. Uh, this type of rotation uh, here is called circumduction, going round in circles. So, these are some of the major movements that are possible. And uh, now let's see the tools which we have for all these movements, uh, which we can perform so smoothly and easily and uh, become conscious of uh, what a marvelous uh, sort of feet it is till uh, we are afflicted with pain in one of the joints. So these are our tools. The joints are our tools for friction-free movement. This talk is a part of uh, the course Yes.03, uh, which is on health sciences and yoga. And this course and all the other courses and activities of uh, the Yes project are a part of the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo and uh, the 75th anniversary of India's independence. Now, this is an extremely simplified picture of uh, a joint, just to get a little clear about a few things. Now, these are the two bones which are forming this joint, and movement at this joint is possible because of the muscles. And one can understand that the muscle, you know, since it's an organ uh, which uh, can uh, contract and then again relax, when it contracts, its length becomes shorter, and when it relaxes, the length returns to its original longer length. So one can understand that if this muscle contracts, it becomes shorter, it will automatically bring this bone closer to this bone. And uh, that will be a type of flexion. So contraction of this muscle will bring about flexion at this joint. And uh, the attachment of this muscle to the bones is different from the muscle. It's not contractile. It is uh, a tissue that uh, looks white in contrast with the muscle, which is uh, almost red. And uh, this uh, tendon differs from the muscle in the sense that it does not contract, but it has great tensile strength, which means that it can stand a great deal of stretching without breaking. It can bend, but does not break. You know, the way we talked about uh, in the bone, there are uh, those collagen fibers which form that network between which uh, is the hard material deposited. Uh, this is something similar to those uh, that network of uh, those uh, 
fibers with a high tensile strength. So the tendons uh, have that great tensile strength and the result is that both these ends are very secure. They are very securely attached to these bones and therefore when the muscle contracts, by and large, these tendons remain undamaged and they can stretch a bit, but uh, they do not break. Then we have uh, ligaments. Ligaments are like tendons, but there is no muscle associated with the ligaments. Now, these ligaments are also attached to the bones and uh, they do not contract, but they can uh, stretch and relax. So one can understand that if this muscle contracts and uh, this bone moves this way, the ligament here will get stretched. And uh, when the muscle relaxes and comes back to its original position, this ligament will relax. So uh, one can understand what will happen to the ligament. The opposite will happen to a ligament which will be on this, which may be on this side of the joint. Now, this is something again, uh, uh, which has great application in uh, many situations. Say, for example, in back pain, we say we should not, uh, we should be cautious about forward bends. Why? Because uh, the ligaments which bind the joints at the back, uh, they will get stressed when we bend forwards. And when they're stressed, they're more likely to break. And uh, any damage which is already there can get further enhanced. And uh, therefore, forward bends are to be avoided. But if we bend backwards, the ligaments would relax. They would not be stretched, they would relax. And uh, that is okay. There's no problem with that. Same applies to the neck. Forward bends, more careful. Backward bends are okay. Now, these ligaments provide a certain degree of stability to the joint, as we can see. And uh, uh, that's possible because these ligaments, like the tendons, again, have great tensile strength. And uh, therefore, they uh, don't easily break. Now, this is the picture of a, a typical joint cut across to show the inside structure. So these are the two bones, bone one and bone two. And then uh, surrounding the joint is uh, a capsule. One can say it's a sort of a packing, a connective tissue packing all around the joint. And uh, then that leaves behind here a cavity. Now, in the, what is there in that cavity? We find that the two surfaces of the bones which are near each other, have cartilage. It's not bony tissue, it's cartilage. Cartilage is uh, like a cushion. It is a rubbery sort of a tissue. And uh, uh, the, this uh, padding uh, would help in uh, reducing the friction and also uh, would uh, uh, avoid the two bones, you know, grating against each other. Uh, this uh, cartilage uh, provides that. Uh, and uh, also in case of a sudden movement, uh, it will also provide some cushioning. So all these things would be possible because of this soft, rubbery, but at the same time, pretty strong material, which is cartilage. Then further, this cavity is filled with a fluid, the synovial fluid, which again uh, has uh, a, for the function of a lubricant, uh, along with these cushions, that lubrication further adds to reduction in friction and makes the movement smooth. And the synovial fluid uh, comes from two sources. The one is the synovial membrane, which secretes into it a substance which is rather viscous, sticky, you know, hyaluronic acid. It's a sticky substance, uh, which is viscous. And uh, then there is uh, there are blood vessels uh, supplying this uh, synovial membrane from where small amounts of fluid keep leaking out, as happens everywhere in the body. And uh, this fluid that leaks out, this watery fluid, also becomes a part of this synovial fluid. So there's a watery component and there's also a sticky component. On the whole, the viscous, the material is therefore viscous, somewhat like oil. And one can understand how this would help. Say, if we look at these two, uh, these two cartilages these on, the, uh, on the two bones, the articular cartilage, as it is called, artic because uh, articulation means uh, joining. And uh, 
this is uh, the cartilage in the joints so articular cartilage if these two uh, this this pair of cartilages were to move against each other there would still be some friction and uh, if this fluid was only watery again the movement will not be so good imagine two plates of glass now glass is a very smooth something very smooth hmm, like the cartilage if you move these two plates of glass against each other uh, they move quite easily but still there is some friction if you wet this glass and then try to move the movement may become a little smooth but then they tend to stick to each other the two plates of glass stick to each other they cannot be easily separated and uh, that also is not what is desirable but if you wet these plates of glass with an oily substance we say with oil then you find not only the movement is friction free even more fric free from friction than if they were just wet with water but then the two plates can also be easily separated so this allows movement which is friction free and at the same time the bones tend no, will not tend to stick to each other these two cartilages they will not stick to each other during the movement so in a way you know it's like uh, uh, bhakti you know devotion that lubricates action or karma in the world uh, uh, the action is there but at the same time the action does not stick the action does not stick to you you don't get attached to the action so that without that attachment without getting sticky that uh, this movement is possible so a typical joint should allow the wanted movement should not allow unwanted movements and this movement should be friction free and same time the joint should be protected and uh, those things are also there one of the uh, things that protects the joint is of course the capsule but there are other protections also available which we shall see as we go along now the articular cartilage here reduces friction it absorbs shocks so suppose you jump from a height and uh, when you land on the floor no matter how tactful you land say you land on your toes not on your heels still the knees have to bear quite a bit of a shock and that shock gets absorbed because of this articular cartilage and uh, articular cartilage is smooth and slippery but does not bind particularly because of the synovial fluid and the synovial fluid the term comes from ovum as you can see ovial ovial refers to related to the ovum or the egg and it is so called because uh, this viscous material here resembles the white of an egg in consistency and that's why this word synovial viscous material it's a viscous material at same time it has water added because of uh, the water oozing out of the capillaries in the uh, synovial membrane and it also has phagocytes the synovial fluid also has phagocytes that is cells which can eat unwanted substances germs and uh, etc and the result is that uh, the functions of this synovial fluid are reduces friction and uh, it performs the functions of blood for the articular cartilage since you know it has material oozing out of uh, the blood vessels here that has nutrients and oxygen which the cartilage can use and the carbon dioxide and waste products which the cartilage produces they can be picked up by this fluid and then return to the blood because this fluid is in exchange with the blood uh with the capillaries which are uh, supplying the synovial membrane and uh, this fluid is like that little fluid you know which is surrounding every cell of the body and why that is necessary is because cartilage itself does not have a blood supply the cartilage doesn't have a blood supply but it gets its nourishment and oxygen from this fluid in the synovial fluid and it also dumps its waste products into this synovial fluid so this functions like blood for the articular cartilage and if there's any damage and there's debris or if any germs enter here then these phagocytes can take care of that so you can see that the synovial fluid not only is a lubricant it is also protective it also has a protective function now why do we need a warm up before exercise 
including yogic practices, especially in the morning. That happens because overnight, the synovial fluid gets more viscous. The viscous component increases, the fluid component decreases, and therefore we feel a little stiff in the morning. And warm up increases uh, that movement, moves the fluid around, also perhaps increases the blood flow to the joint, and uh, uh, therefore relieves uh, this uh, stiffness. And that's why it's important to start with the warm up. But staying immobile overnight makes the synovial fluid viscous. And uh, the movement reduces the viscosity and increases the production of the synovial fluid. And they, from this, we can also understand that uh, the warm up is therefore uh, more essential in the morning than in the afternoon or evening because it's, uh, we have been immobile for a long time at night while sleeping. And that is what uh, makes the synovial fluid more viscous. And uh, it's also more is important for uh, Elder, the elderly than for young people, because in the elderly, in any case, the production of synovial fluid goes down, like all functions decline in an elderly person. Uh, the rate at which the synovial fluid is manufactured, that also goes down. And uh, therefore, the amount of synovial fluid may be reduced. And uh, therefore, morning stiffness is greater and warm-up necessary is also greater in the elderly. Besides immobility, is there anything else that can impair synovial fluid function? And correspondingly, is there something that can help improve synovial fluid function? Yes, uh, apart from immobility, aging is something that uh, impairs synovial fluid function. It reduces its production. And uh, is there something that can improve? Certainly, one can't uh, avoid aging. One can't both live long and uh, not age. But one can slow down the process of aging. And uh, that can be done primarily by two things, exercise, regular physical activity, and massage, regular massage of the body. And both are important. Both of them help by moving the synovial fluid around and perhaps also by increasing the blood flow to the joint, which in turn would increase the production of synovial fluid. Because we have seen that uh, the uh, synovial fluid is produced as a result of uh, the blood and the filtration from the blood. And uh, it's this filtrate uh, which leaves the capillaries, which passes through the capillaries in the synovial membrane, which becomes a part of the synovial fluid. And the other part, the viscous part, is also secreted by the same membrane. And if it has a better blood flow, it will be able to function better, manufacture a little more synovial fluid. And, uh, and therefore, uh, exercise and massage are both useful. Uh, regular physical activity, particularly yogic practices, because uh, they do not really spare any joint. There's just about every joint in the body that gets movement uh, if we perform a judiciously selected set of uh, 10 or 15 asanas, uh, we get a top-to-toe -to -toe workout. Even Surya Namaskar ends up moving just about every joint in the body. This is something that does not happen in ordinary exercises like uh, jogging or cycling or weightlifting. Now, they may exercise only a uh, few selected joints. The rest of the joints may remain quite unaffected. So that's, how you, that's one way in which yogic practices do better than other types of physical activity. Massage. Uh, one can go for a professional massage once in a few months. But then uh, perhaps what is more important is to massage oneself, self-massage. Because that can be done every day. And it takes only uh, 10 minutes extra while having a bath. Uh, so the bath is not just making the body wet. The bath should include a massage. And uh, the general principle, only we'll talk about of the massage, the general principle is that uh, the movements should be gentle, not too tough on the body. And uh, wherever there's a rounded surface like the head or the shoulders, the movement of the hand should be also in circles. Whereas uh, when we are massaging, say, the limbs, the movement should be along the direction of the hair growth. So the hair, you know, grow downwards. So the hand should also move downwards. So during the massage, it moves downwards, then bring it up without actually massaging and then take it down again as you massage the body. And, uh, and this 
away spending uh, 10 minutes extra every day during the bath, massaging the body with oil, uh, which oil and so on again, we'll not go into the details. Probably any oil is better than no oil at all. But uh, uh, sesame oil or till oil is one of the relatively common and uh, oils that are okay. And uh, in the summers when the coconut oil is uh, also fluid, coconut oil is an excellent oil. But then coconut oil cannot be used around the year. And uh, uh, again, uh, Ayurveda experts will tell you that is just as good because uh, the effects of coconut oil and till oil on uh, the three doshas, uh, kapha, pitta, and vata are different. And uh, nature has sort of provided this arrangement uh, for so that we will use the right type of oil in the right season. So coconut oil perhaps in summers is better and till oil or sesame oil better in the winters when it is fluid. Uh, so exercise and massage, these are, uh, this is what can help improve synovial fluid function. And uh, one may be able to get away without exercise and massage as a young person, but then the effects start showing up as a person gets older of course, never too late to begin. One can start even when the effects have started uh, manifesting, when one finds that the joints have started giving trouble. But then prevention is always better than cure. And therefore, it's better to be conscious in young age and uh, start the process as early as possible. And the benefits would be reaped when one gets older. Uh, one will find that the joints will create much less problems. There are people who start getting osteoarthritis at the age of 40, and there are people whose joints move about quite satisfactorily at the 80. Uh, part of the difference is genetic, but also part of the difference is the type of lifestyle they lived from young age onwards. And the two simple things that help a lot are regular physical activity, preferably of the yogic type, yogic practices, and regular massage of the body while having a bath. Now, different types of joints. The hinge joint, as the name suggests, uh, it's like the hinge of a door or a window. And uh, the examples are the knee joint and the elbow joint and the ankle joint. We can see that the movement is possible in only one direction, as in the case of a hinge. And uh, this is a diag diagrammatic representation. Uh, here is... Uh, what we may call a ball-like structure. And here is the socket into which it fits. And this ball can rotate in this only in one direction. That is the type of movement uh, which we have at hinge joints, uh, like the knee or the elbow or the ankle. And also the interphalangeal joints, that is the finger joints at the end where uh, the fingers can be also flexed and extended. Then ball and socket joints. Now here there's a truly a ball and a round socket. And therefore movement is possible in several directions. As you can see here. And uh, the two uh, examples are the hip joint and the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint has much greater mobility than the hip joint, but they're both ball and socket type of joints. The picture here is that of uh, the hip joint. And this is the head of the femur or the thigh bone. And uh, this is the acetabulum or the cup or the socket in uh, the pelvis. And uh, the two fit into each other and uh, it can rotate. The ball can rotate in the socket, giving us the possibility of flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, and circumduction or rotation. Then pivot joints. Here, you know, uh, the it's possible to uh, have a rotatory motion around a pivot. And uh, there are two examples shown here. The radio ulnar joint. That is the joint between the two bones in the forearm. The forearm has two bones. Uh, one which is towards the uh, Inside, that is the ulna, and, the, and towards the outside, that is the radius. And uh, we find that these two bind to each other. 
like this, and uh, you find that this radius is, can rotate within this. And that's how we are able to perform this rotatory motion at the elbow. And then this one uh, is between the first two cervical vertebrae, the first two vertebrae in the neck, C1, which is called the atlas, because uh, on this rests the skull. And uh, atlas, you know, is a character in Greek mythology who carries the globe. And uh, so the head may be compared to the globe, which this uh, vertebra carries. And therefore, this vertebra is, has been named atlas. And then the atlas also has a hole here through which passes this projection. Uh, this projection is called dense, this projection of the second cervical vertebra. So if this passes through this, one can imagine that it will be possible for this to rotate around this. And uh, that's how we are able to uh, turn the head to the right and the left when we want to say no. Then this is a saddle joint. The saddle joint is in the thumb. And uh, uh, which part of the thumb? Right at the beginning of the thumb. Uh, you know, between one of the small bones and uh, this longer bone, uh, the metacarpal. And uh, this is like a saddle. You know, like uh, a person sitting on uh, a horse. Uh, either the rider can move or the horse can move. And uh, that's how you can see that uh, that's how we are able to perform in these uh, movements in the thumb. Other fingers don't have this type of an arrangement and that's why the movements of the thumb are much more versatile than the movements of the other fingers. Now, which is the joint that has the maximum freedom of movement? And you might have guessed from what we have talked so far and even through your own personal experience, that the joint that has the maximum freedom of movement is the shoulder joint. And uh, is there any price to be paid for this maximum freedom of movement? Yes, the price to be paid is that this is a joint that is most likely to get dislocated. Dislocation of the shoulder joint is more common than that of any other joint. And what is dislocation? The two bones that are joined to each other, uh, they get dislocated. It means that uh, one of the bones moves away from the place where it was joined and uh, then it will have to be placed back there again uh, through uh, either manipulation or surgery or whatever, but it has come out of that at least partly. So that is what is dislocation. So there's always a price to be paid for a great amount of freedom. Again, sort of turning to yoga, uh, in integral yoga, there's more freedom available than in perhaps any other uh, uh, school of yoga or any other spiritual path, leave aside religious path, because religions in any case tend to restrict freedom uh, as compared to the spiritual path. But then uh, within these paths, these yogic or spiritual disciplines, integral yoga offers uh, maximum freedom. And uh, therefore, the chances of getting dislocated or derailed are also greater here. For example, if uh, there is, uh, uh, as is quite common in many parts of this type, uh, the person is told that, well, if you've chosen the spiritual path, say goodbye to the rest of the world, uh, change your dress, uh, start wearing white or saffron robed uh, clothes. And after that, uh, you said goodbye, so don't think of the family. Tell the family, I will not contact you. You will not contact me. And uh, uh, I've chosen a different type of path. I have nothing to do with you anymore. Now, that is simple. But then in integral yoga, you don't have to do that. That relationship has to change in spirit, which means that uh, what the mother has said, you know, our relationship should now be that of uh, egoless kindness and goodwill. Egoless? Because ego is the root of attachment. So it should be free from attachment. But at the same time, you continue to be kind and you continue to have goodwill. That is how you express their love, your love for even your pre earlier relationships, including the family, without getting attached. So the love does not finish. Love does not end. But this is love without attachment expressed through egoless uh, 
uh, kindness and goodwill. Now, that is ideal. But at the same time, it may be difficult to practice for the seeker, leave aside the family who will not understand and will feel that, well, if it is possible for you, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you visit us more often? Why don't you spend more time with us? And so on and so forth. So uh, when you have great freedom available, then the chances of getting dislocated are also much greater. Now we turn to the shoulder joint, which has the, this freedom of maximum movement. It's uh, the it's the joint between this hollow or cup-shaped uh, socket in the shoulder blade, which can be felt nicely at the back, and uh, the ball of the humerus or the arm bone. And uh, this is the collarbone or the clavicle, which comes and joins a, a projection from the shoulder blade. And this can be also felt at the back, this union between the end of this collarbone and this projection from the shoulder blade that can also be felt at the back. Now, why this uh, joint has a great freedom of movement is because this cup like cavity in the shoulder blade is uh, relatively hollow. And uh, that's why this great freedom of movement is possible. There's nothing much to, no bony projection or anything to stop it. And this being uh, hollow, uh, this being shallow, uh, this hollow being shallow, the movement, much greater freedom of movement is available. But that is also the reason why the, uh, this ball can get easily dislocated from this socket. However, it doesn't happen too often because uh, there are plenty of ligaments and other structures surrounding it. And you can get some view of it here, the front view of the shoulder joint. And you can see that uh, uh, here, the joint, and uh, then how many ligaments are there around it? All these ligaments, you see. Ligaments here, ligaments here, ligaments here, and uh, so you have plenty of these ligaments binding it from all around, and that's what keeps it in uh, shape, keeps the joint intact most of the time, except when there is a severe trauma. Now, which is the largest and the most complex joint in the body? Again, if you think a little, you would realize that uh, the largest joint is the knee joint, and it's also the most complex. And in fact, the knee joint is a marvel of engineering. Just think of uh, what all it lets us do. It lets us walk or run in the plains and uh, over the hills. We can go down or up a steep incline in a hill, and also walk up and down steps in a staircase. You can go upstairs and downstairs. All these movements are possible at the knee joint, and uh, that is possible because of uh, the way it is constructed, and it is a weight-bearing joint. The weight of almost the entire body rests on the two knees, and that too in the erect posture, which in terms of gravity, which exert a lot of pressure on the knee joint. Now this is uh, the basic knee joint, the bones involved, the thigh bone or the femur, and uh, one of the two bones in the leg, the tibia, which has these two places where it can join and corresponding to that are these two protuberances in the thigh bone. So this is where the basic hinge joint of the knee is. But then in front of it, there is a small little bone, the kneecap, the patella. Now here are just three views shown here. And uh, you don't have to worry about what which structure is. But the idea behind showing this is that uh, the knee joint is uh, one of those joints which is uh, 
packed with a lot of ligaments and other structures which keep it strong at the same time give the leave the movement friction free uh, now here in the superficial view you can see the kneecap and a tendon a tendon coming from one of the major muscles in the front of the thigh inserted here and then a tendon starting from the patella and going down to the shin bone and then your other ligaments here. If you look at, uh, uh, if you cut open a little and see deeper, uh, you can see uh, the cartilage here and uh, lots of other ligaments, again, uh, keeping this intact. And particularly marked with these stars are two ligaments, which you might have heard of, the anterior cruciate ligament or uh, the ACL and the posterior cruciate ligament or the PCL. ACL tear and PCL tear, which are sometimes seen in athletes, uh, are in these ligaments. And they're called cruciate because they have a cross-like you know, arrangement. They start from one side of one of the bones, and, uh, go and uh, get attached to the other side. So they are like a cross and that's why cruciate. So anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate ligaments. and uh, in knee injuries, uh, it is one of these two ligaments that is quite often torn or damaged. And then you have these menisci, the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. These are also pieces of cartilage, but then you can say they are like discs. So one disc here and one disc here, one of them almost complete, one of them not so complete, but all the same, they are basically discs. Uh, discs of cartilage, which uh, we have seen is a smooth rubbery substance with great tensile strength and uh, uh, which can sort of provide good padding. And then if you look at uh, the back, once again, you find a very large number of uh, ligaments binding the knee joint to keep it stable. Now this sort of shows you through a section uh, Looking at it from the side, some of the major sort of things which are reducing the friction in the knee joint and providing protection. Because the number of such structures which you have in the knee joint, you don't have anywhere else. And that is what makes this joint more complex. And that complexity is there because the complexity is necessary. The complexity is very meaningful. Now, Friction is being reduced here by the articular cartilage as happens at every joint. So this is the articular cartilage. The synovial fluid, which is filled in the joint cavity. And uh, these two menisci, one of them, the lateral meniscus that's towards the outside shown here, these discs of cartilage, and then tendon sheets which are not shown here, that is surrounding the tendons. Again, there is a sheath and uh, in that narrow space, again, there is a fluid between the tendon and that sheath and uh, that further reduces the friction. And then, then bursa, what is that bursa? Bursa is a sort of a sac-like pad and uh, you have one here and one here, uh, one above the patella, one below the patella. And uh, then a fat pad here. In this space, there's a pad which is fatty in nature, full of fatty material. And protection is being provided by this bursa here and this bursa here. To some extent, you guess the patella itself protects the knee joint. The patella itself may get damaged, but at least the knee will be spared. And uh, Further, the patella itself being, is being protected by this bursa here and uh, by the ligaments at its, as at every joint, a large number of ligaments which bind. The, something like this, you see something uh, precious is being packed. Hmm? Then uh, you think of all the material that can be used. On one hand, you want to tie it up nicely so that the packet is very secure. So you use a lot of uh, ropes and whatever, tape and whatever. So, you know, you use a variety of materials for uh, protecting it, for keeping it secure. 
you may use rope, you may use tape, you may use a variety of materials, you may use more than one type of material to make it secure. But same time, if inside the box is some fragile material, then you also fill it with packing material. And you may use a variety of packing material depending upon what is uh, more appropriate for what purpose. And you may use a mixture of them. You may use somewhere you may use cotton and somewhere you may use thermocol and some places a bubble wrap and uh, some places foam and uh, some places just shredded pieces of paper. Now, this is all different types of packing material so that fragile stuff does not break. So here again, we find the same strategy being used uh, for uh, packing up the joint so that it is secure. And at the same time, uh, also providing a variety of mechanisms so that the movement is friction free. Now, the difference between uh, the box that we pack with fragile material and the knee joint is that, that the box does not have to move. Here we have to allow for movement and yet provide the same type of stability as well as protection to fragile structures. Now we turn to some of the injuries which are common at the joints as a result of uh, traumatic uh, trauma, say for example in sports or even otherwise. Now there are two terms which one can distinguish between sprain and strain. Uh, the most common example of a sprain is uh, what uh, results from the twisting of the ankle. And uh, this generally leads to the damage of some ligaments. Damage can vary from uh, uh, a little uh, damage to a major tear in some of the ligaments, but the bones are usually not dislocated. On the other hand, a strain uh, is a damage to the muscles, not to the ligaments. Although tendons may be damaged, the tendon attached to the muscle may be damaged. And this results from a sudden and powerful contraction of a muscle. And uh, of this, I have personal experience uh, at the age of around 40. That is the time this type of injuries are most common also. Because, you know, you are aging and yet you do not feel it. The process of aging is so slow that till the age of 40, the person does not feel that the aging has begun. And uh, as I used to do quite commonly, uh, jog and then take the first step suddenly and very fast. And uh, when I did that, once at the age of about 40, I felt as if there was, uh, I was hit at the, on the calf by a pebble. And I thought maybe there was some pebble on the road and that had what uh, had come and hit me. But actually it was not uh, the pebble that had hit. It was the tearing of a muscle inside, the tearing of the calf muscle inside, which had done it. And uh, the muscles can get damaged. They can get torn. And if the muscle gets torn, still it is much better than if the tendon gets torn because the same type of uh, a sudden and powerful contraction of the muscle may sometimes lead to the tearing of the tendon. And why the damage to the tendon or to the ligaments is more serious than damage to the muscle is because the tendons and ligaments have poor blood supply. And therefore, their healing is very slow, unpredictable, and seldom complete. And therefore, how long it will take cannot be uh, easily predicted. In case of bone, it is very simple. The fracture takes about three to four months and one can predict more or less with certainty that the fracture will heal. The bone will become as good as new in a period of three to four months. In case of muscles, a little less predictable, but all the same, still much better than in tendons and ligaments. In case of tendons and ligaments, one cannot be sure. And uh, even after the healing has taken place, it is seldom complete. Because what happens is that uh, uh, during the process of repair, the ligament or the tendon does not get replaced by the same type of uh, material, the same type of fibers which have great tensile strength. Instead, the continuity is restored by connective tissue, that is packing material, which is not strong, which doesn't have the same tensile strength. And therefore, the person remains vulnerable to injury at the same place once again. And that's why sometimes one wonders that uh, this injury was uh, five years ago or 10 years ago. And uh, how, why is it that with just a little uh, 
extra effort or a little accident, I got the injury again. And it's exactly at the same place where it was 10 years ago. That happens that memory is retained because that healing was never really complete. That healing was by the formation of connective tissue, not by the formation of new ligament or a new tendon. So the continuity was restored. One feels that one is all right, but at the same time, uh, one is not completely all right. One has to be careful with that spot throughout life. So that is what uh, uh, the damage to the ligaments and tendons is. Uh, why it's the worst? Muscles a little better and bone almost sure to heal completely and in a predictable time because the blood flow to the bone is much better than to the muscles and the blood flow to the muscles is much better than to the tendons and ligaments. And uh, uh, that's why this difference in the healing capacity and the time taken to heal. Now, by and large, what is the treatment? We'll not go into the details of the treatment of sprains and strains. But as a general principle, the sooner one does some cold fermentation after a sprain or strain, it is better. Why? Because uh, not only the ligaments or tendons or muscles are damaged, the blood vessels in these structures also get damaged. And when the blood vessels get damaged, there is bleeding and that blood collects inside. And the more the blood collects inside, the more the region will have to work on clearing the debris. And uh, therefore, the first priority is to check this bleeding, to reduce this bleeding so that less blood collects there, which will reduce the pain as well as reduce the amount of work to be done in the process of healing to clear the debris itself. And uh, one way to, simple way to reduce the blood flow there uh, is to use a cold pack, a cold pack, ice cold pack, but not for a very long time, maybe 15, 20 minutes or so. And then one can leave the place without that cold pack and repeat it after an hour or two for another 10 or 15 minutes. And this can be, this is most helpful. The sooner it is done after the injury, the better. Because one can understand that the bleeding has started at the time of injury. After that, in any case, the bleeding will keep getting less as time goes on through the natural process of uh, clotting, etc. But uh, to reduce the blood flow immediately, it's better to apply the cold pack. The sooner, the better. Cold pack is of some use in the first 24 hours, maybe of a little use up to 48 hours, but after 48 hours, it's of no use. After 48 hours, what is more useful is a hot pack, hot fermentation. Why? Because that increases the blood flow and increase in the blood flow is what we need for healing. So as a general principle, uh, I apply cold during the first 24 hours, the sooner the better. And hot fermentation 48 hours after the injury. That is the general principle of this type of soft tissue injuries as they are called. Soft tissue because bone is the hard tissue. So compared to the hard tissue, an injury to a muscle or a tendon or a ligament is a soft tissue injury. And the soft tissue injuries don't even show on an x-ray. They don't show on an x-ray. It's only the bony fractures which show on an x-ray, not the damage to the muscles, tendons and ligaments. What is the effect of aging on the joints? Uh, the production of this lubricating fluid, synovial fluid, is reduced. The articular cartilage becomes thinner and ligaments shorten and become less flexible. So you can see in general a decline in all types of functions, which is understandable with aging. But then the process of aging can be slowed down through regular physical activity, through proper nutrition, through a healthy lifestyle as a whole. And what are the consequences of these? The most common is osteoarthritis. There are very few people above the age of 70 who do not show at least some osteoarthritic changes on an X-ray. And uh, age-related degenerative changes in the spine, in the vertebral column. In the spine uh, appear as the hunched over posture. That's because of the reduction in the space between individual vertebrae. The discs become narrower and they become narrower more in the front than towards the back. And that's how it leads to a hunched over posture. One tends to bend forwards, have a hump at the back. And uh, we have seen that uh, having that proper space provided by the intervertebral discs is important to let the nerves come out of the vertebral column. So 
this not only leads to a poor posture, it can also increase pressure on the nerve roots, which may show up as pain, which may show up as weakness in a limb, and so on. But the most common consequence is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is uh, partly aging and partly wear and tear. Now, wear and tear is a tricky thing because if one does not use a joint, there will be no wear and tear. But then if one does not use a joint, uh, the muscles will grow weak and that doesn't mean that the person will be protected from disease. So how much exertion and what type of exertion therefore becomes important Certainly, there's no question of not using the joint. Expose the joint to unnecessary trauma, which does not give corresponding amount of exercise or physical activity. For example, while walking, one should not be stamping the foot on the floor you know, the way uh, a soldier might or a child might while throwing a temper tantrum. No, not, that is the type, not the type of movement so which will help the joints. And it will not give any exercise either. So as in the, the general principle is, use it or lose it. That applies to the brain and that also applies to all the parts of the body. We should continue using them, but then use them with understanding. And uh, that will reduce the wear and tear while the joint is still being used. And if it is used, the synovial fluid production will continue at a good pace. And uh, along with that exercise, if we also massage the joints, massage the body, that will further reduce the effects of wear and tear. Now, what contributes to this wear and tear is not just using the joints, but also aging and genetic factors, and therefore osteoarthritis tends to run in families. The most commonly affected joint is the knee, and next most commonly affected is the hip. Now, this is in contrast with rheumatoid arthritis, in which it is the small joints in fingers, etc., that are affected. In osteoarthritis, it is mainly the big joints like the knees and the hips that are affected. And uh, because of uh, the effects of aging, the cartilage is thin and worn out and can have some damage. Uh, and the result of this cartilage thinning is that the two bones which are joined to each other in the joint start rubbing against each other. That is painful. That produces a grating sensation that makes induces, uh, introduces friction into the movement. And one of the responses of this type of trauma to the bone, because of inadequate cushioning by the cartilage and the synovial fluid, is that bony spurs may develop. That is, extra bone may develop on the sides, which is unwanted. It's a protective response on the part of the bone, but uh, actually it makes the movement painful. Some of these spurs may grow into muscles and uh, therefore the movement becomes more and more restricted and painful. Sometimes to look at what is going on in the joint in case of uh, osteoarthritis and even more commonly in case of uh, injuries which might have led to the tear of uh, the anterior cruciate ligament or posterior cruciate ligament, the doctor takes a look into the joint and that is called arthroscopy. Arthroscopy, in arthroscopy, what is done is a thin tube is introduced through a very small hole into the joint. And at the tip of that tube is a light and a camera. And at the other end of this tube, the doctor can then see inside the joint and uh, see exactly what has happened inside. And at the same sitting, if he finds that uh, some manipulation, some surgery can uh, repair the damage, they repair that injury, he can sometimes do that also. So it's both can be not just diagnostic, it can also be therapeutic. Means the treatment can also be done while the arthroscopy is going on because the doctor can see exactly what has happened to which uh, meniscus or uh, ligament and if uh, surgical correction is possible, then that can be done at the same setting while looking through the same tube because the doctor has a clear view of it. So with minimum uh, invasion, you know, without doing open surgery of the whole joint, one can do certain types of repairs. It's something like uh, laparoscopic surgery. You know, in the abdomen also, with uh, a small through a small hole, one can do quite a bit of surgery instead of opening up the abdomen. So the trend is towards minimally invasive surgery. 
that is minimum invasion and yet doing the surgery and that has become possible because now we have these tubes which have a light and a camera at the tip so that the doctor can get a good view of what is inside can 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 approach the inside with fine surgical tools without uh, opening up the whole thing you might uh, have sometimes reflected upon why some eating places are called eating joints It's a, an eating place is not just a place for refueling. An eating place can also serve as a, a place around which people uh, can talk and uh, share joys and sorrows, share what happened during the day, share ideas and opinions, discuss issues. Conversations flows more smoothly while you eat. And uh, therefore, uh, eating, you know, is uh, one of the things which uh, is often used uh, in uh, offices, uh, et cetera, also business places also, to sort of ease the relationship, to make the relationship more informal so that conversation flows more freely. Conversation becomes friction-free. So friction-free, frank, candid conversation flows smoothly while we eat. And that's perhaps why these are called eating joints. So essentially, a joint is a smooth relationship. And what applies to the smooth relationship to joints, if one reflects, applies quite a bit also to human relationships. And they become smooth through the same process, the same type of friction reducing and protective mechanisms as we find in the joints. So the type of relationship two bones, which two bones have in a joint, is a uh, for us also a lesson for life. I'd like to express my gratitude for the pictures as well as for a lot of learning that has come from this book, Principles of Anatomy and Physiology by Toto Ryan Grabowski. This is a picture postcard view of Shirobindo Ashram Delhi branch, the place where I live and work and the place from where I'm speaking. If you have any questions or comments, please drop us an email on yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Sri for making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there. Close today's session with a moment of silence and meet tomorrow for next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.